We have been looking at the life of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John, and over the last several Sundays we have looked at what happened on the cross. And now that the atonement has been completed, now that the new covenant is open for business, now that all of the work of forgiveness has been completed and done, uh, Jesus commended his spirit into the Father's hands, and he breathed his last because his work was done. John continues and tells us what happens in the moments following his death. If you recall that it has been dark, we don't know how widespread the darkness was, but the region is the, is the Greek word that is used. How big is a Greek region? We don't know, but it's an area. It is my guess that the people standing around the, the cross could look over the horizon and only see dark and dark and dark wherever they're at. And you have to believe that in the darkness, in the lack of light and heat from the sun, that it is getting kind of gloomy and maybe even a little cold and spooky with what is going on out there. And this is Friday, and Friday comes before Saturday, and in the Jewish calendar, the Sabbath is a weekly holy day that is celebrated with great ritual and with great fervor of obedience. And throughout the whole arrest and trial and torture and putting Jesus on the cross, the main characters that have been pushing this forward have been the chief priests. The chief priests, uh, led by the high priest of Caiaphas, have been egging the Romans on, have been telling Pilate what to do, have been the, the main instigators of moving this forward, and their belief because it is stated several times in the Gospel of John, is that if they do this particular thing, for example, they don't go into the, the house of Pilate. When Jesus was taken to Pilate by the temple guards, they did not go into the house of Pilate, and it says that they didn't go in because they didn't want to be defiled for the Passover. They didn't want to be defiled for for serving God because there were, there were plans put together. And if you look at Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you will see very detailed responses that if somehow you were defiled, you had to step aside and not participate in the Passover with the, your family and with your friends. You had to do it a month later with all the other people who were defiled. And of course, the, the public humiliation that the chief priest would have felt if he would have been defiled and not allowed to lead his families, his large extended families, Passover, and perhaps he even led the Passover for all of Jerusalem. That would have been unbearable, and so they were very careful to, to, to step very gently and to not go where they're not supposed to go. And what they do after Jesus dies is, is like that is along those same lines. If you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, we're going to start in verse 31. So imagine, if you will, the people are on the cross. It is difficult to see because the only light you have is either torches or lamps and fire light. Handheld firelight is not a very sure thing. It casts shadows all over the place randomly. And so it may have been difficult for them to see who was breathing and who was not, who was still alive and who was not. And the way the Romans liked to do crucifixions, because crucifixions were a deterrent, was to nail somebody to a cross and leave them there until they were fully decomposed, leave them there until the birds and the animals had picked the skeleton clean, and then they would go and they would remove whatever bones were left. And so this could have taken 
a month or more for this process to be so that everybody who walked by would, would be fully aware that this person had offended the Roman government and that they would not want to do that same crime because they would not want to end up this way. However, you have three people a stone's throw from Jerusalem. And so the chief priests, and Caiaphas may have been among them, come and they go to Pilate and they say, basically, get those people off the crosses. It's only going to be, it's going to be sundown soon. And the difficulty with that is it's dark. And if your only way of telling the time is a sundial, then when it's dark, you got a problem. And it may have been, they may have been confused as to what time it was. They may have been confused how late in the day it was because at three o'clock, Jesus dies at three o'clock in the afternoon and according to scripture, the lights come back on. The temple is torn, tombs open up and people walk around. There's a great earthquake and the lights come back on instantly so that people can see and people as they're blinking and trying to realize what has happened, I'm sure that the religious people in the group were happy that it hadn't been sundown yet, that they hadn't missed the Sabbath, that in their, in their darkness, whatever they conceived it to be, they hadn't messed up on missing the Sabbath and so they they run, as it were, to Pilate and say, we have to get these people off the cross, please break their legs. And the first question is, why do they have to get off the cross? Well, once again, you go back to Leviticus, you go back to Deuteronomy, and there was a punishment that if you had a, a malefactor, if you had a blaspheming person who was just anti-God, who was perhaps a serial killer or a serial rapist or something that was really disrupting the town and, and had no remorse, they were totally anti-God, then they could be stoned to death and then hung on a tree uh, by the neck usually or tied to a tree. And it says back in the Old Testament that that would be a public sign that anybody who who hangs on a tree is to be cursed. They are to be considered a total law breaker, not just one sin, but breaking all of them. And that's why the Bible is clear that Jesus takes on that, that position for us, a total law breaker, that we who have broken all the laws, all that sin is put on him and because he was hung on a tree, it is a public declaration to God and everybody that he is taking the place of all of the law breakers, that he has broken every single law, not in himself, but vicariously. He, we have and we put it on him. And so the passages in the Old Testament continue that says if you allow a person to stay on that tree past sundown, then the whole land is cursed. So everybody in the town where this person is hanging on the tree will be considered an absolute lawbreaker. And then they would have to go through the rituals to, to gain forgiveness for that. And so the, the chief priests being, being very clear about what it is, what it takes to get God's favor, sees what's happening in the world. And what's happening in the world is that you have a whole week of preparation for Passover. Passover comes every year. It comes on the 15th of Nisan, is the Jewish month. And it's like, see, our Easter bounces around, but it's always on a Sunday. Theirs is like Christmas. Christmas is always on the 25th, so it could be on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every year, who knows. You look at a calendar, you'll figure it out. And so that Saturday, the day after what's going on, is the high day of Passover, but it's also a Sabbath. So it's like a double whammy of holiness. It's a double whammy of greatness. It's something that they really want to do good 
because they know God's watching, and if they do this just right, fulfill all the Sabbath laws and all the Passover laws, that God's going to see and be gracious and bless them and, and do all this kind of stuff. And so they have to get these people off the trees, off the crosses, before sundown, or the whole thing's ruined. All of Jerusalem will be cursed, and all of their preparation for Passover and the Sabbath will be meaningless because everybody in Jerusalem will be defiled. And so they're scampering. Uh, we can look at, at, at tables, and about this time of Passover, sundown was 6.15, 6.30, something like that. It's now 3 o'clock. They're scrambling to their, uh, to their sundials. They go, okay, we got a couple, three hours. We got good. We got to get them off the cross. We got to get our lambs. We got to set everything up. We got to do this. And there's all the disruption of the Holy of Holies being exposed to the world because the temple was torn in two and everybody can now gaze into this private place that only the high priest could go into. And so that's causing a bit of, of anxiety, if you will. There's a lot of things going on and they want to make sure that when the sun goes down, because in the Jewish calendar, the next day starts when the sun goes down. So Passover and the Sabbath will start that evening when the sun goes down, not at midnight, not the next day. So they really only have a couple, three hours to get this all taken care of before Passover starts, or they will be cursed by God, is their view. And so they go to Pilate and they say, Break their legs. Now, what does break their legs do? When you're put on a cross, you are stretched out. And your body is going into a state of shock during this whole thing. It is difficult to breathe. Your heart rate is erratic. Uh, as I've said before, people do this. People have, we have studied crucifixions, uh, both uh, tying people to a wall with a bunch of sensors on them, and if you can go to the Philippines, they'll actually nail you to a cross. And we have observed for th hundreds of years, at least, with recording devices, how people respond. So we know basically how these people are going to respond. It is difficult to breathe, the blood pressure is erratic, the heart rate is erratic. And if you break the legs, that puts people into a state of instant shock, instant blood loss and blood pressure loss, and it becomes very difficult to breathe. So in a matter of seconds, a person, when you break their legs, and the way they would do it is with a huge iron mallet, so it actually would shatter the leg bones. Uh, and so when you put that much pressure, an already pressured body, uh, in a matter of seconds they would die. It is a way to, uh, m some would say, mercifully end the, the crucifixion. You're not up there for a month being eaten away by the birds and the animals, uh, but it's a, it's the whole crucifixion thing is a very painful way to go. And so the priests knew this, and they knew this because every seven years, Passover is on a Saturday. So they knew exactly what to do. They knew every, you know, they had a system because it comes around every, you know, it moves down every day, down a week. And so they knew exactly what they were doing. And so they say, break their legs and get them off. And so Pilate sends them and says, uh, go ahead and do it. He kind of wants the chief priest to get out of his face. He wants to be done with Jesus, that if Jesus is pulled off the cross early, Pilate sees that as a win-win, probably, because he would never have to deal with Jesus again. Jesus will be put in the tomb, and that will be it in Pilate's thinking. And so they go, and the, the, uh, the, the Romans get their big mallet and they go and they break the, the legs of the first thief and of the second thief. And then they get to Jesus and they notice he's already dead. And this is a, this is a surprise. And if you look in Mark 15, 42, 
Joseph of Arimathea actually goes to Pilate in, in that book and asks for the body of Jesus, and Pilate exclaims, he's surprised, is Jesus dead already? So Jesus may have set a record, people think, with the way that the Romans were reacting in dying so quickly. And if we look at the logic of why Jesus was on the cross, he had a set number of things to do. And we don't know how long it takes to put all that sin on him, and we don't know how long it takes to, to dump the full wrath of God on him. But apparently it's quick enough that when he's done, he just gives his spirit to God and he dies because his work is done. His goal is not to live as long as possible on the cross. His goal is to get the atonement done and then move on. And so in a matter of hours as opposed to days, Jesus dies on the cross and the Pilate is surprised in Mark. The, in John, the Roman guards are a bit surprised. One of them may not have believed and sticks him in the side with a spear. And when you look at that, that was not commanded, that was not given in any way, and, and we, can, we can kind of guess at the thinking that, that here's Roman soldiers who are killing machines, and Pilate said, make sure they're dead. And if they, they take Jesus off the cross and he's just in a coma or something, then, then that Roman soldier that was supposed to break his legs is going to be in real trouble. And so perhaps just on a whim... Uh, Raymond Brown, a commentator, says that it's the, it's the illogic of ordinary life, that he just doesn't know what to do, so he thrusts a spear into Jesus' side, and he puts it in far enough that he is sure that Jesus is dead. It isn't a planned thing by the Romans. There's no record anywhere else in Roman documentation that this was a standard crucifixion practice. And so it says that immediately or at once there came out blood and water and many people, a bunch of people, perhaps to sell books, will come up with mystical explanations of this is what it means, of, of it's this or that, and, and medical people have looked at that and said, well, the, the, the spear must have hit this or hit that. Uh, clearly, John is saying it not in any symbolic way. He is just saying it as proof that Jesus is dead. And there's no documentation, extra-biblical or not, about how the Jews tested for death. Uh, we don't know if this was a normal practice, that when somebody died by being uh, cut, for example... They would consider the death to be complete when water and blood came out. Uh, it's probably not water, but probably some clear bodily fluid, but John doesn't know nothing. And so he's just writing that this is Jesus who is dead. When John was writing this, there was a group of people called the Gnostics who were coming into being, and they're still around today. You can go to Santa Cruz and, and visit a Gnostic bookstore, and they meet there, actually. I don't know what they do. But the Gnostics are all about secret hidden knowledge, and their view is that physical things, things you can touch, are evil. Things that are spiritual are good. And so in one Gnostic writing, it says that Jesus was a spirit that Jesus could not have been a physical man because if he was a physical man, he would have been evil. That would have made God evil and you can't have that. So their logic is that Jesus was a spirit. And John may be saying, neener, neener, neener to the Gnostics, saying, look, it's a physical. Actual physical fluids are coming out of this. It's a physical guy with physical stuff. And he's really physically dead. And that is John's point, is that Death has occurred, and that is vitally important for the chapters that follow 
when Jesus is resurrected, if Jesus only passed out or swooned or was in a coma, then the resurrection has no power to it. But if Jesus is absolutely dead, and we know that the cut or the stab in his side was deep enough for Thomas to actually put his hand in it and to prove that Jesus was who Jesus said. And so it went in far and it was a gash and Jesus is dead. Jesus did not respond. He didn't say, ouch. He didn't wince. He is dead. His body is dead. And then John starts his, his conclusion to the crucifixion. And his conclusion of the crucifixion says, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. John has this practice, whether it be humility or, or whatever it is, to speak about himself in the third person. He never says, I. He never says, John. He always refers to himself by some other Means And in this way, he is saying, uh, he and his and he, referring to himself. John was there at the foot of the cross throughout the whole thing, throughout the darkness, throughout the lights coming on, seeing the scrambling of the Jewish leaders. And he was there when the spear was thrust into the side of Jesus. And he says that he bears witness that his testimony is true and that he knows that he is telling the truth. And he is using language that fits with the Old Testament witness deciding thing. Back in the Old Testament, if somebody was accused, you had to have two witnesses that said the same thing. They tried that with Jesus and no witnesses could agree, and it is so important to the Jewish law that God put it in the Ten Commandments that you shall not bear false witness. That is much more specific than just lying. You are not supposed to lie according to Scripture, but it's a big thing if you, in an official capacity, bear a false witness, lie to get somebody uh, accused, somebody to be convicted and to be punished in that way. And so John is giving a three-time statement about he saw it and it's true and it's true. And he says it for one purpose only, that you will believe. And at this point in time, all he wants you to believe is that Jesus Christ has died, that Jesus Christ has taken your sins and put his blood over them and he has died. At this point in time, salvation has been secured for those who believe. And he wants people to believe that. He wants you, people to believe in this person, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And then to, to wrap it all up, John gives two more scriptures to be fulfilled. John, more than any other gospel writer says that Jesus fulfilled this scripture and that scripture. And even in Jesus' death, when Jesus is totally passive, related to what's going on, Jesus could not have caused this, but God did. There are two scriptures, and we read uh, in Exodus about how the Passover lamb is put together. It is believed that John is actually quoting Psalm 3420, which says, He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. And if you read all of Psalms 34, David is talking about a righteous man who serves God. It isn't particularly a messianic sort of psalm. But John believes that this is talking about Jesus, and we take it one step further, and as we read in Exodus, this also shows that Jesus is the Passover lamb, that as Passover is going to start being celebrated in a couple of hours, Jesus is the perfect, blemish-free Passover lamb, even in death, in, in Exodus, the idea is that when you're picking the sheep to begin with, it cannot have any broken legs. But Jesus, his whole life, 
never had a broken bone, even in death. And God controlled the situation with his absolute sovereignty to take Jesus before the chief priests got antsy and before the Romans got aggressive and started breaking legs. And he put in the mind of the Roman soldier that it would be pointless or useless to break Jesus' legs, I'm sure. And then he probably put in the mind also that he needed to stab him with a spear, which comes from Zechariah. Zechariah is talking about the future coming Messiah on the throne of David. That the throne of David is in disarray at the time of Zechariah. And Zechariah is looking forward saying, there will come a time where God will pour out his spirit on his Messiah and we will look at the one who is pierced. And you may just kind of look over that wondering what it means, except we know that John is on the ball, and John figured it out, and so John puts that in his gospel, saying, clearly, this is a sign, this is evidence that Jesus is the one that Zechariah is talking about, that when Zechariah talks about the one who is pierced is, is Messiah, clearly he's connecting the dots and saying, that is Jesus. And so to put it all together, you have two types of people in this story. You have the type of people who scramble around working, striving, doing, working off of a checklist even, trying to please God, believing that by my own actions, God will be pleased and God will bless me, that in everything I do and everything I say, the chief priest would say, they are earning God's love. They are earning God's presence. They are earning God's blessing. And of course, every step they take fulfills another step of prophecy and moves Jesus closer and closer to the resurrection. And today the world is full of people who are doing things, many who just wave the flag of Jesus but have no content to it. They're trying to live a certain way, believing that God would never judge a person because after all, they've never killed anybody or they've never sinned that much. They believe that they will be judged on their works and everybody who is not saved will in fact be judged on their works and all of them will fail. Then you have John who sees things happening and he sees the sovereignty of God in them. And his statement is, I've witnessed the Son of God die on a cross. And that witness is true, and he says it so that you will believe. There's another group of people today that we might call witnesses. Those are the saved people. Those are people who have had an encounter with God. Those are people whom God has revealed himself, and they have accepted him, and they have seen God work in their life, and what we do is we witness truthfully. We say what we know. We know things from Scripture, for example. We interpret the events of our lives from Scripture, but the gospel is in Scripture. The gospel is that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again on the third day. And that is what we witness, that is our testimony, that is what we tell. And when we do that, there are some who will believe. There are some who God has been preparing the soil. And when you say it, and it may be the first time they hear it, it may be the 150th time they've heard it. When you say it, they may say, Ow, I get it. And boom, they're saved. Not because anything you did, but because you testified to what you know, knowing that it's absolutely true. And they believed. That is the promise of Scripture that some will believe. And so we can be people who are always trying to strive and earn God's blessing, or we can be people who rest in the salvation that we have, and in resting in that salvation, 
We can share it. We can tell people. We can bring people along. We can, holding on to the life preserver, grab one more person and bring them into the lifeboat. That is what John is telling us to do today. That Christ actually died on that cross and salvation is actually being offered. And when we tell it, some will believe. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just thank you for this day. I just thank you for this truth that every prophecy is kept, that everything we read is true, that Jesus died for sinners, and that if we tell people, if we live it, if we show it, some will believe. And Lord, we praise you for that and ask your blessing on the remainder of the day. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen.